I'm Besa Luce, and welcome to Other Talking Points, a K2.0 podcast. With this episode, we are wrapping up the first season of Other Talking Points. We're planning to start back up in September, so follow K2.0 on social media to get the latest updates. In our last episode for the season, we are revisiting the topic of travel. Not long ago, when we recorded our first episode, we explored travel in the region and what it tells us about our shared past, our current sense of belonging, and our understanding of one another. One aspect of the conversation was the long isolation of Kosovars due to the EU's visa regime. For years, practically the only places Kosovars could travel to without going through a dehumanizing visa application process were neighboring countries. A recent investigation by K2.0, titled We Are in a Real Ghetto, highlighted this arbitrary and expensive visa application. For Kosovars, travel abroad has long been an exhausting and uncertain prospect. But change seems to be underway. On April 18th, the European Parliament decided to lift visa requirements for Kosovars starting in January 2024, nearly 15 years after other countries in the region were granted this right. What will Kosovars do come January? Will everyone leave? Who will stay? Why stay? There are rising fears that young people will clear out as soon as they can. In advance, some are pleading for them to stay. In a recent blog call, K2.0 asks Kosovars the questions. What keeps you in Kosovo? Do we owe it to Kosovo to stay? Will travel start feeling more like a normal activity rather than an escape? In anticipation of the publication of these blogs in June, I'm happy to be joined by Ilir Goshi and Aulion Kadriu to discuss some of the responses we got from young Kosovars and also to further explore our relationship to travel. Ilir Goshi works at the intersection of media, activism, art, and technology. He was a guest in the first episode of Other Talking Points, and he wrote an article last year for K2.0 titled The Alternative Balkan Postal Service, which was recently shortlisted for the European Press Prize for Distinguished Reporting. Aulion Kadriu is an editor at K2.0 and one of the producers of Other Talking Points. She was the author of We Are in a Real Ghetto, K2.0's investigation on visa processing, and is the lead editor on our recent blog call. Ilir and Aulion, I'm super excited to have both of you on the show. Ilir, it's great to have you as the guest ending the first season, as you were also uh, the first one of the, my first guests in the first epi- episode of Other Talking Points. So welcome. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, it's an honor to be here again. And Aulion, we've been working on this podcast since the beginning uh, together. So again, super excited to actually have you now also as a as a guest and to talk a bit more about uh, your work at K two point zero and further. Thank you for having me, Besan. So, Aulion, let's start with you. And I want to start with the story. Uh, we are in a real ghetto because I know that last year you spent a significant amount of time investigating how visa applications for Schengen visas in Kosovo were not being handled correctly at a lot of the companies, outsourced companies that embassies in Kosovo are using to handle visa application processes. You exposed a lot of uh, a lot of times that there's a lot of regulations that are being breached that are not in line with how the visa code, which regulates the process, so they're not in line with how the visa code foresees application processes to be handled. And I think there was also a level, quite a big level of frustration during that investigation because because on one hand, we were the only country still subject to a visa regime with with the EU. And then at the same time, you were figuring out that how that process is being handled is actually breaching the visa code. So can you maybe just talk a bit and highlight some of the main issues in this regard? And then to a bit expand on how do you think the experiences that many Kosovars have been going through with visa application processes has also affected their relationship to travel itself? Um, Thank you, Besa, and thank you for highlighting the the research we've done. Um, As you yourself said, the... The research has two aspects that it covers. So it's a, it's built on the on the belief, if I may, or uh, in, in the stance that the visa regime itself is an unjust process that Kosovars are being subject to uh, from the EU. So it tries to tackle that a bit, but 
not to focus on it because the visa liberalization for Kosovo is an issue that has been widely discussed. But what was missing to the discussion was, of course, as it usually happens, a discussion about experiences of people, what's happening to them. Like, while we've seen the EU or our institutional representatives uh, discussing, advocating and demanding visa liberalization, uh, we have not seen nor the EU or our own institutional representatives talking about what people are going through or even scrutinizing countries of the EU in how they're handling visa application processes for Kosovo. So that was what the research aimed to do. So we we got the visa code, which is a, is a legally binding uh, document for EU countries. And we went point by point and really based on our own experience and then based on the experiences of tens of people we spoke to, we saw that many of those points highlighted uh, in the visa code were being actually breached and violated by by the very EU countries, by the very EU where um, we see as the promise of happiness, as, as, the, as, as the place we want to identify with. Uh, so to sum up a bit of the, of the violations, first, uh, one of the biggest concern and the biggest uh, frustrations was, of course, the fact that uh, Kosovars have to spend a lot of money and and that uh, spend a lot of unreasonable amounts of money uh, to apply for a visa. We saw that uh, with uh, many, many EU countries have uh, engaged private companies to uh, handle their visa application processes. Uh, so it's as, as most Kosovars should already know it's a TLS, VFS, and the visa metric. And these private companies have uh, added the cost for Kosovars. Like they have a service fee that everyone must 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 pay to in order to apply so it's it's first the cost we we saw that 19 uh, between 20 2014 and 2021 kosovars spend like uh, 99 million euros in applying for a 600,000 ap- visa application 20% of which were uh, rejected and then of course uh, setting an appointment for a visa, which, you know, the visa code calls for an appointment for a visa to be set within two weeks. Kosovars have to wait for a month and five months. And adding to this, when people really need to travel urgently, when they're sick, which is also one of the main, I, I mean, I cannot say main, but one of the reasons that makes people travel, because later on we'll talk about the fact that people don't just travel for fun nowadays in Kosovo. So they have to wait one to five months for a visa application, although this is in violation with the visa code. They we have uh, they have to submit a ridiculous amount of documents, <clears throat> sometimes including x-rays or an HIV uh, status test or uh, blood tests uh, in order to... to to be considered eligible for a new visa. And um, I mean, there's also a concern with uh, with personal data. We've, uh, we've been, we've, we've discussed both with experts, but also with people that have applied for visas and, and they are very uh, worried that the personnel at the, at the visa application centers has, has oftentimes uh, uh, gone beyond their legal, you know, beyond what's legally allowed and have asked very weird, uh, bizarre questions to, to the applicants. And in general, also there's this, uh, there's this feeling of being unwelcome every time someone goes to apply for a visa, of, being, uh, uh, of having a dehumanizing experience, as many of them have, have highlighted. So it's, it's really a conglomerate of, of violations that have ultimately, which brings me to, to, your, next, to your next question, how has this affected travel? So uh, from what I could see from the people I have I have talked with, uh, they are all people that need to travel. They are all people that want to travel, but they are all people that actually avoid traveling because it has become to them an experience that is related to uh, aggressive behavior, to dehumanizing practices, to... Um, very costly uh, expenses uh, to um, having to prove literally that that you're human to to the embassy personnel. So what I've seen is that people now um, people now not only 
are not willing to travel, but they're also rejecting it. Like they, I, as I have myself done so often. So it to them, it has become an action they will undertake only if they have to, from, from what I could find. Yes, exactly. I mean, uh, that, that comes across, I think, in the frustration of many people that you, you interviewed in the story. Uh, and also, I just know from personal anecdotes, a lot of people that w were traveling a lot for work and reaching this tip, <laughs> this point where they were like, I just don't want to go through that process again. And I'm not going to travel, e even if I need to travel for work until the visa liberalization is actually, uh, actually granted. So we've seen a lot of kind of uh, pushback, I think, uh, like that. And Ilir, I mean, uh, Serbia, together with uh, all the other countries in the region, they've been basically enjoying uh, visa liberalization since some since 2008, some since 2010. So more or less uh, uh, around 15, 15 years now. And I'm taking you a bit back in time in 2008 when uh, uh, when in Serbia the visa regime was lifted. Do you remember? Do you remember what were the conversations taking place at that time? And uh, in what way do you think people's in the scope of the past decade, how has people's relationship to travel changed uh, Changed as a, as a result? Because one thing we keep hearing also now in Kosovo is that a lot of people will leave. And sometimes you'll hear people also referencing that there was a big wave of people leaving from Macedonia, uh, for example. But nobody talks about the fact that a lot of people just get to the opportunity to travel to travel freely. So how what has happened in this more than like... The, 10 years with regard to how people have developed their and changed their relationship to travel in Serbia, if you can reflect a bit on that. Mm -hmm. um, well, for me, it's actually quite easy to go back in time uh, because I remember that very day very clearly. Uh, and while I do not remember the conversations I was having with other people at the time about this, I remember very well the conversations I had in my head about this. Uh, and I remember my first thoughts uh, went further back in time to several, um, so let's say, incidents I've had in embassies previously applying for visas, different occasions. Uh, and I remember this, um, this lady working at the desk at the Hungarian embassy um, I was applying for a visa to get to, I wanted to go to a Nick Cave concert in, in Budapest in 2006, I think, or 2007. And at the time, it was by far the most important thing for me I could even possibly think of. And she literally just took this bundle of, of documents, much of which I could not understand the purpose in this context. And she just threw it away to the side. She said no. And I remember how shocked I was uh, because I... The only thing I could mumble was that I only want to go to the Nick Cave concert because I, I couldn't understand why would someone want to prevent me from doing this. Um, and later I realized that this really came from my own uh, wrong belief, wrong expectation that we somehow are the same, are equal. And uh, we have the right to access this this also physical space, but not just physical, on the um, equal basis with everyone else who is already part of, of that space. So it took me time to realize that it probably wasn't the case and that it wasn't because of this particular lady, uh, nor it was because of that particular uh, Italian uh, Carabinieri officer who made me count all the cash I had with me on a train between Ljubljana and Venice in 2003, simply because he wanted to humiliate me in front of everyone. It took me time to realize, uh, as is the case with our own research, I think, that these are all elements of a system denying us these rights, denying us the same access and giving us actually a very uniformed message uh, and I think there there is a there is some sort of reason for that to tell us that we are not as welcome as we would want to be. So that's as far as my impressions go, and my, as far as my memory goes. But as for your second part of the question, um, it's difficult to say how this change in the visa regime reflected on on things in Serbia. Um, easy way of answering would be. There are so many people migrating from Serbia to places in Western Europe every year. 
But once you get deeper into this, you realize you don't really have the numbers. You don't have really have the data, uh, the reliable data that you could use uh, to analyze these trends. So most people and media, they operate with this figure of uh, 50,000 people leaving Serbia every year. Uh, it's around, it's just below, let's say 0.8% of the country's population. So in 10 years time, it's around half a million uh, or around 8% of what the current population of Serbia is right now. Uh, but when you look at the, the actual research, you realize that uh, there is no direct data to draw from. So um, we cannot really talk about uh, verifiable trends, if that makes sense from the context of your question. Exactly, it totally makes sense, and I think it helps me connect with you, uh, with you, Aulona, very, uh, very nicely. Because you know, Elit is talking, for example, that you hear these numbers, and then sometimes there's like people are leaving, and then you'll hear phrases like brain drain or like this idea that entire sectors are just gonna lose the workforce, or that we're gonna have a lack of access into services or, or whatnot. And we've been hearing this now in Kosovo since the lifting of the regime uh, is upcoming in in January do you, do you think it's a like do you think there's also a bit of an exaggeration in 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 all of this how how are you reflecting on this these current conversations uh, in Kosovo i i do believe that it is an exaggeration and i think much more than it it i think same as the eu these kinds of calls and and assume that Kosovo cannot be home you know uh, they they assume that Kosovo cannot be a place that you actually want to stay because you feel connected to it, because you build your life here, because everyone you love is here. So it operates with the same <laughs> idea why we have been uh, isolated for so long, so long, I think. So uh, I do think that ultimately uh, the idea of how we travel, why we travel must be changed and we have the right to access that change, to be to be part of that change, like we we are. As I'm, I'm saying when I say we, I'm I'm talking more uh, in terms of young men and women. We are constantly uh, uh, given this burden, if I may, of a patriotic duty to to stay and to make this place better. But uh, I think the call for us to stay should not be oriented towards us, but should be oriented towards the institutions that can make this country a better place for us to stay. So uh, for as long as we focus on on telling everyone stay and, and survive, because at, at times it is it is for young men and women who struggle in poverty, who struggle in, in lack of access to education or health health care or everyone, not not really just young men and women. It is it, it becomes sometimes survival. And of course, they must have the right to see what's out there uh, because uh, uh, this right has been taken away from us for so, lo so long by someone external. And we don't want someone internal to take this and to add to the pressure that the EU has given to it. So I, I partially I blame the EU for building this narrative about itself. Part, of course, uh, I fully blame the EU for building the narrative around itself that, that it is the object of happiness. It is the place where happiness will be found. And hence, I think there's this fear that everyone will run towards that promise. But ultimately, I think if someone thinks the EU is happiness, everyone should have access to go there, to 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 access that that place. But I also blame our local institutions because we see we saw recently with with the visa with the visa violations and everything. We see that uh, it, it's another topic, but we'll, maybe we'll we'll touch upon it. We see that you cannot just ask someone to stay and make this place hostile for them to stay. So you have to really mobilize and work. And our institutions and all the structures that have the power to make such calls and then to, to uh, inject within us that it is unpatriotic to leave, they're also responsible for making this place uh, a better place for us to stay. So I think that's where the discussion should be oriented. Exactly. And I think, uh, as you mentioned uh, a bit at the beginning, that uh, a lot of that pressure and weight is put so much on on, on citizens and uh, and I think this is what is what complicates so for, also for me personally this uh, conversation sometimes because yes of course you don't want 
let's say, like in Kosovo, there's been a lot of reports that uh, uh, a lot of workers within the health sector have been leaving for years and getting jobs in Germany. And there's different schemes and programs available for them to get jobs there. So now with visa liberalization, even though visa liberalization, it's it's only for free travel, but there's like this fear that like the entire health sector is just going to become deserted and nobody's going to be there. So on one hand, of course, we don't want our countries any countries, you know, to be in that kind of a situation. But at the same time, focusing just on that side of the narrative, I feel like it completely completely disregards and ignores just people's, like, right to individual agency and indiv individual uh, individual choice. Because, yes, we're aware that in our countries, there's a lot of people lack a lot of socioeconomic uh, prospects. There's high unemployment or corruption, poverty, different degrees in different places. But still, people should also just... Uh, have the right to live their own individual uh, individual life. And I'm curious, Ilir, um, I think this is very true for Kosovo. Are, are certain, like similar narratives, have they persisted, for example, in Serbia or have you come across them in uh, other spaces uh, in, in the region? I do think that there's probably some commonality because we've all been undergoing these kind of so-called democratization processes. And I think a lot of that language around democratization has also been shaped in that way where a lot of uh, of the responsibilities placed on citizens sometimes more than kind of, not more than on institutions, but equally, whereas as Arlon said, the biggest pres pressure has to be actually on institutions if you want people to feel that they have prospects to stay within their own country. So what have been some of the dynamics maybe there? Mm -hmm. um, well, I I think it's, uh, it's different. Uh, we don't have this uh, patriotic call. Uh, in Serbia, or at least not as often. Of course, it's 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 being occasionally promoted by uh, by the by the institutions. By the I mean, we don't have really any institutions. So uh, by by the regime, if I could call it like that, um, that people should stay. But then I think it's really the sense of hopelessness uh, that's that's uh, making people leave, and it's not it's not the quality, um, it's not the concrete, tangible uh quality of everyday life it's about the expectation from tomorrow that makes a difference so uh, if you were in a very bad position uh and there was a chance that things would get even slightly better tomorrow and then slightly better the day after tomorrow i think uh so many people would actually stay and we, we saw this only for a short period of time after the year 2000, uh, when the uh, fall of Milosevic happened and this old regime went to history, not for a long time, because soon after it was kind of um, reinstalled. But in this short period, we actually had the reverse process. There were so many uh, young people coming back to Serbia from places like Canada, uh, United States, all over Europe, uh, New Zealand, Australia, they they felt uh, this desire to come back and to help build this new uh, democratic society. And uh, it was it was quite visible at the time. You had thousands of people coming back, wanting to use their knowledge, their skills, whatever they they gained um, while they were away, to help build this new society. But now it's it's uh, quite different, and I think it's this sense of hopelessness uh, that is primarily pushing people to, to leave. And of course, I, I fully agree that uh, it's ultimately uh, primarily um, and maybe even exclusively uh, the responsibility of, of the system, of institutions, of the state uh, to provide not the quality of life that someone could have in, in in Germany or in Switzerland or in Norway for that matter. It's just this sensation that things are moving in a good direction. And uh, currently and for many years, this uh, feeling has been lacking. Uh, that's at least my, my how I how I understand it. And that's also the primary reason people are leaving. And actually, to uh, to connect upon this hopelessness that Ilir is uh, is talking about, uh, because I, mean, I think some of the things we were talking about earlier about people feeling also that they have like this pressure, a weight, responsibility, sometimes uh, even I would say expectation to stay in Kosovo and help 
build Kosovo. I think it connects also with a particular experience of, of the war. And I also like after 99, so this idea that you finally have like freedom and you can build a country, then 2008 declaration of independence. And I think this has also added to this, uh, uh, to this feeling that uh, where people feel like, well, then now we have to leave. We have our own country. And we've seen, I think, also in Kosovo, people coming back a lot from the from the diaspora. But then people would come to invest, but then you would hear stories of disappointment and of leaving again. So there are also these uh, kind of layers of hopelessness that I think we're seeing also uh, also also in in Kosovo uh, in Kosovo as well. So people and people have been have been leaving actually over the past few years. So kind of to all these uh, voices out there that uh, are making this exaggeration that the country will just be empty after January 2024, 20, uh, what have you seen through the blogs that we are preparing? What makes actually people want to stay? And you talked a bit earlier about the fact that ultimately it's also home for some uh, for some people, but what are the different young voices uh, uh Talking, talking about in the blogs that uh, you're overseeing for Kate Queen Zero. Based based on the responses from the blog, I would say we shouldn't worry. No one is leaving. Everyone <laughs> is looking forward to staying and making this this country better. Which, of course, it it is uh, it is absolutely amazing to see uh, my fellow young men and women uh, seeing their potential and and being willing to to fulfill it in Kosovo in in their country but i also think it's as as you said what i saw in the blogs there's this idea of being abroad as something very hor- horrible because i think it's very connected to how people had to leave kosovo at a certain uh, a point in history like they had to they had to flee the war they had to escape they had to run away and they didn't didn't have any contact with their family members and i see that that idea of uh, of being abroad there's this albanian word being being in gurbet i don't know what's the what's the word but it it's very charged like you're you're away you're alone there's so there's so many songs about it there's so many poetries and books about it like it's this 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 place of agony of misery of longing to see your loved ones and never having the chance to to see them and and being worried about them which is which is very real like these are experiences that have existed and have ultimately affected apparently how we experience travel uh, to this day like i see many people many people in the blogs which are which is which are all very uh, rich and beautiful contribution even refer to to those poetries to those uh, works of literature like this is what this is what being away means and i think this is uh this is because we've all we've actually been isolated like many people also in the modern modern time uh, the so-called modern like when we've declared our independence when we were free and and were technology made it possible for us to communicate it was still difficult because people were escaping through illegal uh ways they they were migrating they were still not being able to return return whenever they wanted to their country which which really uh cemented this idea that traveling is is something very charged it's like a one time decision is it's very heavy so um i see that this exists this still exists among young men and women and and i fully fully understand why it is happening but um I also see that uh, many of the young men and women that have said that I want to stay are people that have actually been to Europe, like have had the chance to travel, to see what Europe is, to to touch this dream. And uh, they're not impressed by it, you know. <laughs> so it's, I think, I think uh, the EU has, by, by, the, it would have been smarter if the EU wouldn't have a visa regime because m- most probably people would just return to Kosovo and not be impressed with the EU and and or or bring ideas that they see there or bring ideas, you know, change the country. So I ultimately what I see in, in the blogs is a a big desire to say, be it for the feeling of home, be it for the laugh of of someone that you don't want to leave behind, be it for their schools. And uh, what's 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 really beautiful, what someone says is, ironically, the things 
that make me want to leave are the things that make me want to stay, which is like there are there's so much going on. There are so uh, uh, there's poverty, nepotism, corruption, but these are exactly the things I want to stay in to change. So I don't think it's necessarily like a, a an irrational desire to just stay, but it's more uh, among these young men and women, it's more an informed awareness that they can change it, they have the potential to change things and they will actually stay and demand uh, change. I think they know where the problem is, which is wonderful, and I, I think they are willing to radically ask for change. You were talking, just a quick follow-up on that, you said that uh, kind of a lot of people in the blog that are talking about actually wanting to stay in Kosovo are those that had the opportunity to travel to Europe and they were not impressed. And can you just elaborate a bit on that in what ways they were uh, they were mm -hmm. not impressed it's by what it's more that they they saw what life is they saw that while being away and act like it's i don't know when when you see the eiffel tower in the movies it's it's something very magical and when you go there it's just a bunch of you know iron put together and at first it feels amazing but then i guess the the it just a structure, sorry, it's just a structure, you know. So I think this is the feeling they have, like they see it, they access it, they, they experience it, but actually people are no different. There's not like, because it would be, I mean, it would be weird if they had anything miraculous about them. So I think just the idea of touching something you have not been allowed to touch and seeing it and, and just uh, feeding your desire, I guess. It's just, it's very uh, basic among us humans, I guess. Uh, so I just see that they're, they miss home, basically. There's not a particular big reason why they are not so impressed by the EU, you know, just I've seen it and now I really want to go back to where I belong, more the sense of belonging and home. Yeah, no, and I, I think that's always been very important kind of in this entire conversation with the visa regime that Kosovo has been, continues actually until next year to be subject to. It's that it's also just prevented, especially younger generations from having that kind of experience of just being also young and traveling and seeing and because otherwise, the fact that it has gone on for so long, it creates way more space for illusions also to be to be created. But I think another important aspect of this conversation, and in terms of why people from the region sometimes like want to migrate, I think it's also economical. And because there's also a lot of cases where somebody from the family migrates to get a job, but then they send back the money f to their families remaining in their in their, in their their countries. So, um, Ilir, can you talk a bit maybe also uh, uh, about this? Because you were talking earlier that one of the reasons that people are leaving is because of hopelessness. And I don't want to imply that hopelessness is only equatable to <laughs> to money necessarily because hopelessness can be with a, as a result of a lot of different uh, different things but how do you see the uh, the the financial uh, implications also in 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 all of this and in making people want to just ha get a job uh, uh, elsewhere mm, well i guess that for for the vast majority of people, uh, financial reasons or that of uh, possibility of employment um, are the reasons why why they leave. Um, and as to the quality of, of their li life in this other place they, they migrate to, I mean, I guess people have all kinds of experiences, uh, I mean, between different countries and different cities and even inside even within one small town, you could have a variety of experiences so different from each other, depending on your, you know, entry point, the social network, the kind of job. I mean, there are so many variables there. So, uh, but the fact is that unemployment in Serbia, in most places, uh, apart from uh, the, the capital or the regional centers, is quite high. I think it is a bit lower than, than in Kosovo, but it's still quite high, especially among youth. Um, and yeah, that's, that's the reason why they go. There is also this, I read the research about, uh, about these migration trends. This is just one 
research I managed to find. Uh, and it's also involved the concepts uh, of uh, temporary migration and uh, it's called like uh, circular migration, meaning that not everyone who leaves will necessarily stay there. Uh, many people go and then come back and then go again and then come back again. Also because under the, the current visa regime, uh, Serbian citizens are lo- allowed to stay in the White Schengen area, the White Schengen list area for three months. Uh, so many people just go and work for a couple of months and then come back before uh, they their stay is officially illegal. And then after another three months, they go and do, they do this again. Uh, and of course, uh, the question of uh, the the ability to travel is one thing, and then the question of ability to work to have employment is is a different thing. Um, and there is also a, a very good point in this research. Uh, it concerns the the so called brain drain, um, because so many people are obsessed with this idea of uh, literally everyone with high education leaving Serbia. Um, but then the, the figures, those that are accessible, they actually show that uh, the educational structure of people that left uh, is almost the same as the educational structure of the population of Serbia, meaning that there are more people with secondary education leaving uh, much more than th- those with a university degree. Um, and if anything, it is uh, service industry jobs. Uh, it's like literally impossible to find a, a plumber in Belgrade these days because most of them went to Germany. It's also very difficult uh, in construction business because uh, all of the construction workers, engineers, everyone has left uh, to earn more money. And now they're importing uh, labor, the importing workers from places like uh, India, Bangladesh and so on. Since a couple of months ago, apparently there are bus drivers in, in Belgrade uh, from Bangladesh, which is also on the other side, ironically, uh, strengthening this uh, xenophobic uh, anti-migrant, oh, they come to take away our jobs uh, narrative. Uh, but it seems like we've become part of this um, wagon train uh, of uh, of labor in which you know, people in the third class wagon, they, they want to move to the second class wagon. And then those in the second class, they want to, to move to the first class. Uh, and it's just this uh, stream from the the periphery towards the, the center of, of, of economic power. And Serbia has, has become part of, of this chain. That's so interesting because, I mean, one thing that I thought of uh, now listening to you is that you know, the, the narrative now surrounding workers coming to Serbia is exactly the type of narrative that people from the region face when they go in, when they go to Europe to work. They treat it as a migrant who's coming to steal our to steal our jobs. We just saw what happened in the UK a couple of months ago when there was this huge uh, like sensationalism in the media, but also very problematic language from government with regard to migration happening from uh, Albania to the uh, from Albania to to the UK. And there's also something else at the beginning, Ilir, you were talking about that your memory of a dehumanizing experience when you wanted to just get a visa to go to a Nick Cave, Nick Cave concert back in 2006. So both of these uh, examples are just making me think how sometimes as societies, as people, kind of we, we tend to, to forget uh, what we have gone through the moment that we don't have to undergo such a, let's say, and experience ourselves so like and we forget those stories and those experiences because for example citizens of Serbia Macedonia Albania and Bosnia have been enjoying free visa since 2008 2010 but for Kosovo and probably the majority of them have forgotten what what that process uh, was and Kosovars have continued to actually go through that process but there was not necessarily that much, let's say, solidarity. Or now, like with this narrative that you're talking about, workers that are facing in uh, uh, facing in Serbia, this kind of uh, rejection that they're coming to steal the jobs. A lot of people from the region have faced those kind of uh, uh, those kind of barriers. So why why we don't? Uh, I don't know. Societies. Maybe I know this is a bit of a big question, but maybe we can focus it 
narrow it a bit more uh, to the role of the media and the responsibility that media have actually in making these parallels and making sure that we don't forget very recent histories of uh, discrimination, basically, or uh, or, or just uh, exclusionary narratives. So, how how would you comment on this, maybe uh, Aulon, and how can like we as media make sure that even for us Kosovars, when we ultimately start traveling without visas in January 2024, it doesn't mean that people elsewhere are not uh, going through the same type of uh, arbitrary or dehumanizing uh, processes. I think it's it's been so difficult to break through with stories of being discriminated against that we have come maybe to understand these stories as isolated cases maybe of like to to refer to one example like when when I was coming back and and, and I told you about this when I was coming back from one EU country the flight I was in was going to Skopje and it was the only the only flight I could see the only passengers that were being controlled with a dog you know after we passed every security check a dog was sniffing around us and and no one was really uh, mindful about people being afraid or what was going on like it was just let's let's get through with this because i guess we've, we've, we we as, as citizens as as peoples from the balkans we've been faced with so much discrimination so at times it has become it has not necessarily become a cause because it has become a personal struggle to just get through with it so i think i think yes uh media media plays a, a an important role on on problematizing these experiences as as not isolated but as as common experiences some common people from the balkans have and uh, and i i think it it was it was great that you mentioned solidarity and we're lacking it be it with one another within our countries i believe and then and then uh <laughs> with with the countries like i haven't seen anything like any any serious initiative from any countries in the balkans problematize the fact that uh, kosovars are the only ones being isolated kosovars are being the only one facing a very unfair visa regime and um we forget i believe but uh, i don't think the eu will allow us to forget because honestly i i i think that uh, what ilir said about being humiliated from the police in italy i believe that's going to be our experience in the future as well like when we go th- in in customs and we see like the last time i traveled i also saw that it said EU, EU citizens, and then it just says passports, and other, and other passports. I it think just says, says yeah. passport, and, and to me, it 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 is a deeply discriminatory pattern to not be even uh, recognized as a citizen, but you're just other passport, you know. And I think we, the media, can also help us understand critically these these bits and pieces of our experiences, like like we could. And and of course, it comes to be able to oppose these experiences comes with a certain level of privilege because people cannot just can can just stop at the customs and tell the police this is not right because they will be ultimately returned and they will have no protection from the institutions within their country or anyone else. So it comes with a level of privilege that some of us have, some of us that have the resources, that have people around us. And I think... The media can help us critically voice these, but also be able to critically assess these these experiences every time we have them. So we should use this this privilege that to to speak up and to oppose these practices every time we're faced with them. And I'm certain that we will be faced with them in the future. Thanks, thanks, Aulion. Uh, Ilir, you would like to connect, I think, uh, on the same question as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, uh, of course, I agree. The med- media play play a, a huge role in this, but we should also not forget that it's also people working in media. So whatever the, the prejudice, whatever stereotypes exist in the world around media, uh, it is it is quite possible that some of it will, will spill into uh, the way they think they should report about things. Uh, and talking about this, I think it's really one of the, the meta questions for me, at least, you know, how come that 
uh, when we experience discrimination, we are not able to use this experience to understand uh, the reasons behind it and the consequences of it, and then to avoid acting in a discriminatory way towards someone else. Um, and I, I always think about, I mean, it's not the perfect analogy, but I think it will work. Um, I know about this uh, Katunar expression in, in Kosovo, and uh, there is, of course, the same thing in Serbia. Um, there is always someone saying, oh, this city used to be a decent place to live until they came. And I remember visiting this uh, small village in a mountainous region in uh, Western Serbia. And it was on a hill above this larger city. And I was sitting there in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a pub, kafana, whatever. And there was a guy in this mountainous village telling me about people from the hill above the village that came down to the village and destroyed their you know, decent way of living. So no matter how high your village is, there is always one village higher and they are the ones to blame. So I think there is this um, weird need in people to always find someone to discriminate against. You know, there is it's like a relationship. You suffer from those uh, more powerful than you, than you and then you find someone with less power uh, to suffer from you. I mean, not everyone is like this, uh, but to me, it probably tells a bit as to why there is so little solidarity. We think once we are accepted on a list, any list, white Schengen list or any other list, we maybe feel, oh, this, this belongs to us, but it doesn't belong to everyone. It's just us. It's our natural right because maybe we are better than the others. And I think this is a really wrong way of, of looking at it. So it's really important that we recognize this and as Aoyon said to use every opportunity to, to to fight against this especially from from the position of more power exactly Th thanks so much Elir, for uh, for that both of you for your answers to this last question and i'm going to slowly bring it to the end with a with a last question for uh, for the episode and yeah on a personal note to both of you uh, you're both people that are constantly on the move or have the opportunities to to travel whether because of work or studies in the past and just want to know what 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 pulls you back what uh, to to Kosovo to Serbia to the to the region why you choose to come back or why you choose to uh, uh, to stay Aulion um, I think one of the main main reasons that has pulled me back and made me stay is the fact that anywhere I've gone I've always engaged with the people and the countries I have engaged with in a way that I will use my voice here. This will this experience will serve me for my context in Kosovo. This you know I'm it, it's this it's this connection, this growth with with the causes here, with the with the other fellow activists, journalists, people that are really pushing to actually uh, change some of the issues we mentioned that are the reasons why people leave. Uh, the connection with them, I think this big, strong sense of solidarity, this appreciation and this feeling of fulfillment when I see these people support one another and actually radically demand change and use their voice here. I think that's that's one of the strongest reasons why I would I would never, at least not for now, intend to leave to leave Kosovo because I think I have everywhere I've gone I've informed myself, but my voice ultimately is is a voice for this space. So, I guess. And Ilir, what pulls you back? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm thinking about. Uh... Your question, uh, I've been thinking about for a long time. Um, well, firstly, uh, I mean, it's a personal question, so it's a personal answer. I am like traditionally not, not really good in, in making uh, rational long term uh, decisions. Uh, and I, I get hooked on, on ideas and, and quite easily. I mean, things that, that make it seem like they, they make sense working on. Uh, so, 
whenever I would think about leaving, something would pop up and I would get really excited about, uh, you know, working for this media foundation in Serbia or before that, uh, making this uh, massive legal uh, guide uh, thing for, for, for secondary school students. I mean, there is so much space for great things to be done. And there are so many incredible people to work with. And you can also, especially when you're working on the local community level with NGOs or with small media, you can produce tangible change and you can feel it and you can see the meaning of this for the community. And then you go back to the bigger picture and and you feel that uh, the society you're living in is, is doomed and that you wasted another three years or five or 10. Uh, and I've always been, um, what's the word, like, not really balancing, because balancing sounds good uh, between these two things, you know, it's it's either, I mean, first you feel like this, and then it changes, and then you go back to feeling like that, thinking, oh, no, no, no this other thing is wrong, and then you're, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult process. But it's also, uh, I think I don't said it in the beginning, uh, if I remember it right, things um for me the th- reasons why i want to leave are exactly the reasons why i want to stay in a way because uh and another non-related uh anecdotes uh from a from a bus trip from belgrade to pristina there is this uh place uh like a place where you stop for coffee and once i was having my coffee and the driver gets up and goes to the bus and then everyone leaves following the driver. But then the driver realizes I'm having my coffee still. And he's like, ah, you should finish your coffee first. We will wait for you. And, you know, what what kind of a place in the world you would have this experience, like of a driver deciding to wait until you finish your coffee, not because he appreciates you as a human being, but because it's a sacred ritual of coffee drinking, and he would never ever interrupt that. But then on the other hand, if you were the one waiting for that bus, you would get so pissed because of this. And it's just a very banal example. Things get much rougher when it comes to all kinds of informalities in the Balkans. Um, I just love it here. And you know, the only place I lived abroad actually is Pristina, and it only made it more difficult for me to even think about leaving because now instead of having one home i feel like having two two homes so everything doubled you know the reasons to leave doubled and the reasons to stay doubled so um yeah i think (laughs) you know and that was beautiful i mean mentioning two homes because ultimately you know uh, home is where people want to make it no and there's uh, nothing also that prevents people from having a sense of belonging in a lot, lot of different places, but I guess at the end it will make the question of where to stay a bit more more difficult. But I do think it's also uh, beautiful to be able to encounter that sense of uh, home in in many many different places. And I think a lot of people uh, from our region, because of our history with migration, have that. Sometimes maybe also struggle uh, struggle with that. Thank yes, you. Sir. If I may just add something, uh, I just wanted to say um, that uh, when we talk about migrations and we talk about this patriotic expectations from people, uh, you know, we, we often lose from sight that I don't think anyone really wants to leave. You know, anyone really wants to go because it's it's actually so difficult to leave your home uh, and to go someplace else just because it's difficult to live uh, in your place. Uh, and people should be aware of this, that, you know, it, it's it's so devastating. It's so sad on so many levels that people have to leave in the first place. And then contrasted to that, um, you know, I think it's it's funny how, how little hope we need to run on hope as, as human beings. You know, we don't need as much we don't need everything to change dramatically today we just need a little bit and this tiny bit can and has to be provided by the institutions of societies we live in uh to make us stay and that's that's what i wanted to say no and i agree that's very much true but i think at the same time, I think one also other part of the conversation, and uh, it was it was super nice to explore it with both of you today, is the, the 
the fact that it shouldn't be seen as a complete wrong when people also want to choose to to leave or to have another form of experience because I think that's also something that sometimes uh, we've been uh, we've been told to feel and to uh, and to think so while of course everybody has a connection let's say with the place they're place they're from different people have different levels of attachment and how much and how they want to contribute and be a part of change also I think people in the region can also just feel have the right to feel fine with wanting to uh to ultimately leave and maybe they'll come back maybe they 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 won't uh, uh that's i guess how it goes for uh, for a lot of people thank you so much uh Ilir and Arlon for being on the show on the show it was super nice talking uh talking to both of you today thank you thank you Basil. other talking points is the k2.0 podcast You can listen to it regularly on our website, kosovo2.0.com, or by subscribing to Kosovo 2.0 on Spotify. 